Thanks, everyone. Please join me in welcoming Michael Murray. Now I work at a company called Lookout, where I run security intelligence. And I know there was another person up here earlier today that I missed who was talking about malware scoring with machine learning. But uh, I, I think the space that we're in is particularly interesting. Because when you think about real bad guys in the world, the, the real espionage actor, actor and, and you know, espionage is, through cybersecurity means has been a real hot topic lately between uh, Russians with the elections and uh, Chinese stealing IP from American companies and, and a few others. But we tend to think of espionage through cyber warfare as ha happening against computers. Well, I'm here to tell you that uh, that's not actually what the most interesting thing is with these days. Because you all carry around a device with you that is the ultimately the, the dream of any Cold War spy agency. The idea that you would literally volunteer to set this thing on your bedside next to you every night that has an incredible microphone and camera that can be always connected to the internet and uh, activated remotely. And we see it across the board. It doesn't matter which nation state it is. All of them are attacking phones. And so it's interesting because the world has changed a lot. Um, I grew up in a time when computers had 640K of memory in them. And um, to this day, I wouldn't dream of building a computer that didn't have AV on it. And yet, the iPhone 7 has exactly the same capability as the Cray 3 supercomputer. Let's play a fun game, because you guys aren't a security audience for once in my life. How many of you have security software on your phone? Uh, maybe 10% of the audience. And that's crazy. How many of you have security software on your home computer, AV of some sort? All of you, literally, right? Even if you're running a Mac, most of you still do. And this is where the world is changing. And so the bad guys are attacking phones. It starts out with the spear phishing campaign. And don't worry, I'll get to the data science part of this in a minute. Uh, but I have to set frame, right? I, and, and it's important to understand that, that this is happening worldwide. It doesn't matter if you are looking at Ukrainian missile targeting. By the way, do you know that missile targeting software runs on an Android tablet that's attached to the missiles? I kid you not. Um, medical devices are being built that are Android tablets with probes plugged into the headphone jack. That's, that's a medical device these days. And these things get infected with ransomware and with spyware and, and can be taken advantage of to spy on you. And it doesn't matter if you are in the US and being targeted by Russians, if you are Chinese, it all looks the same. And it all starts with somebody sending a spear phishing email that lets them install some software that generally takes over everything on the phone or tablet and lets them control the whole thing remotely to steal everything there is to steal off the device. And this is pretty much ubiqui ubiquitous. We go into, into enterprises, we find about 3% of devices are infected. Now, the interesting thing about this is the way that we used to do security is broken. Because the way you used to do security for stuff like this is you would hire a team of really smart hacker types who would sit around and program into your software all kinds of signatures that would figure out how to detect this stuff. But the mobile ecosystem is so much bigger and so much broader. Um, I had my slides out of order in my head. So much bigger and so much broader than we are used to that you can't throw people at it. We get about 90,000 new apps a day from our ecosystem. And I can't hire enough people to manually process those applications. Just not possible. Um, we're on over 100 million phones worldwide. Um, figuring out telemetry from that is the definition of a big data problem. And so we can't approach security the way we used to. We have to approach it from a data perspective. Because the only way to find the really significant bad actors is to take that data set and attempt to have the machine solve the problem. Um, 
we are used to as a, and, and so it's a funny thing for me as a security person because I have found that in security, we have a hard time dealing with data science as a discipline. Um, my, personal, my personal opinion is that part of that is that the data scientists and the security people are all used to being the uber nerds in the room. They don't always work together well. And so you find that a lot of the security people, even the ones that say they are doing big data, they're really not doing data science well. They're applying old school security methodology and trying to throw some fuzzy math at it and call it a data science solution. We're not because we're actually globally distributed and we actually have a data set that is so large uh, and that 90,000 apps a day leads to a corpus. I looked at our, cor our, our corpus of all applications today. We have 42 million different apps in our, in our database of applications. Um, when you're at that size, just applying signatures to it doesn't work. There, and, and frankly, the bad guys have gotten so good at overwhelming the security industry with data that, to give an example, we have one malware author that sends out hundreds of new iterations of their malware every day to beat signature analysis. We have over a million samples of one piece of malware that have small changes in the way the code works to, dis to defeat signatures. At that point, the only, oh, this is old, that says 30, it's now 42. Um, the only way we can handle that level of, of data is to actually solve it with machine learning. So the way we're doing it for applications is really, I think, kind of interesting. What we're doing is we start out by using a vector space model for code to fingerprint code and allow us to sort uh, code families by, by distance. Basically, in that million sample family that I mentioned, what we're doing is we're taking each class and we're vectorizing it. And then using cosine similarity between that and every other piece of code that we have to determine if code is of a particular set of families based on code distance. That allows us to take small changes that malware authors are using to iterate and group them down into a single, into a single set of families. That's how I know that one family has a million samples is because it's not like there's any signature that we could write because they're iterating through so quickly all the different permutations that they can make. Our only hope is to use, uh, to basically vectorize that and to, to collapse that into a single family. Then, once we've got all of those vectorizations done, and once we've got all of those um, sets of code families together, then we start to use a clustering algorithm to basically determine how likely is something to be good or bad. Um, this is. Actually, the, this is about a year old now, um, but in terms of accuracy of our machine learning, um, zero to one scale, what we find is that what the machine learning says is likely to be malware is almost 100% malware already. Uh, part of that is the fact that we're training it on a known set. But the set, the set we're training it on is very small compared to the actual, um, to the actual corpus that it's running on. But what I think is interesting is the, effect is the effectiveness of this when it comes to actually detecting malware. In that small amount that we're not currently classing as malware, that's where we find new malware families, new threat families, and I send the humans to go do interesting things. I pulled this last week, which is the list of top candidates of things that are likely to be malware. And you don't have to be a security researcher to figure this out. Um, this app is com.android.google device with a Chinese character name. Think that's, that's likely to be sketchy? Or how about com.google.market, play market. And by the way, if you, click on, if you were to click on that, it actually uses the play market logo. Um, and you see, we don't have to solve this by, I have to throw humans at looking at all 42 million apps. I can just start at the top of this, and I'm probably pretty likely to find some interesting and sketchy things going on. And, and so you can start to shape the way that the humans are actually performing the work. In the old days, what we would have done is we would have done a lot of manual analysis. We would have gone and looked for things that look for, that, uh, look for the calendar, or things that activate the microphone, and spend time sorting out 
the com.google.markets of the world from legitimate things that access the microphone or access your calendar. Um, whereas now we're applying machine learning to start solving this problem at a much more uh, effective and efficient way, just because we have to in order to keep up with the volume. At the same time, we're not quite yet at the point where, where you can turn the machine learning free. Where, and, and we see that nobody else in the space really is either. It is still relatively difficult to teach the computer to divine intent. Um, for example, our application, which is a security application, which does a lot of highly privileged things on the device, machine learning has a hard time telling if that's a security application doing the right thing or a piece of malware doing the wrong thing. And so there's still some amount of human that needs to be provided to the, to the process to, do, uh, to find malware amongst applications where you may actually have something legitimate. Now on the other side, when you start talking about looking at the telemetry from 100 million devices, we do it a different way. From a telemetry perspective, the goal isn't to find all the good things, because frankly, all the iPhones that are not compromised is probably not a very interesting set of, set of data. All the, all the iPhones that work perfectly is not the best way. So what we actually do is we gather an insane amount of data about every device. Um, every device that's in our network, we collect effectively what our marketing people like to call a fingerprint. But basically, what it is is it's a whole lot of it's it's a whole lot of data points about configuration of the files on the system and the configuration of the system itself. And on a relatively regular interval, we compress that and send it up to the cloud so that we can make decisions on it. And what we do with that is relatively simple. And actually, um, we saw the presentation by the uh, NASA guy a couple hours ago who was talking about anomaly detection, taking that firmware and basically clustering it and doing anomaly detection on the small sets of clusters is the most productive way to find advanced attacks against the device. Because when you start talking about a nation state actor, you know, the, the Russians, the Chinese, the the you know the five eyes and and some of the the really sketchy people out there they're really good at hiding from security companies. Um, we found in August of last year, and I'll talk about this in a minute. We found uh, a particularly sketchy actor known as the NSO Group, who are my the closest thing I've ever seen in the real world to a Bond villain. Uh, I kid you not. They they actually have the. They're this really sketchy Israeli group, and what they do is they sell cyber weapons to second-level governments. We found them when we worked with a, an NGO called Citizen Lab, because Citizen, one of Citizen Lab's uh, friends, who's a dissident in the Middle East, got a sketchy text message and luckily sent it to Citizen Lab, and, and they called us and said, How do, what do we do with this? Because it was, it was one of the most sophisticated things I've ever seen. But basically, when you clicked on it, it would infect your, it, all that you would see is the browser would pop open and then close. And from then on, your phone would be infected at a level where it would be reporting your location and recording all of your information and sending it back to, in this case, the government of the UAE, who didn't particularly like this dissident. But it could have been anybody. Um, and the last time this guy got infected with something, people showed up at his house in the middle of the night, dragged him out of his house, and he wasn't seen for months. So this is the kind of group that NSO is. They sell to. They, they sell to governments for lawful purposes, which is how they get away with selling their software. But lawful is defined by the government who uses it. So when the government who uses it is Mexico or the UAE or Panama or Kenya, what is lawful is sort of dependent on uh, your perspective. And so when, when it comes to finding somebody like NSO, they managed to evade. They literally went in the Wall Street Journal. This is why I say they're Bond villains. They, they literally went in the Wall Street Journal and said, nobody can find us, we're ghosts. Like, insanely cocky. But they were right. No security, per, no security company found them in the first six years that they were operating. Nobody ever caught them um, until we came along. And, and I have personally made it my life's mission to make these guys' uh, lives hard, because nobody, uh, nobody likes an arms dealer especially one that makes $100 million a year selling to, to countries that are attacking dissidents. So what we do is we basically apply that anomaly detection set of patterns to our data set. And that data set can, can be 
um, not just the things on the device, but we also have data around where those devices show up. You know, I, I can tell um, if that anomalous detection is coming from Mexico or if it's coming from Europe. Um, as well, we see certain traits in accounts. We see applications that are on device. And when we start to track an actor like this, we can start to put together pieces um, of this puzzle that becomes figuring out the signal from the noise. And so tracking NSO became this game where we would find an, an NSO infected device, and then we'd find all the anomalies on that device things that looked out of place, and then start looking through our data set to find other things, other devices that showed similar anomalies. And that's how you start to track really highly evasive bad people. Um, in this situation, we then took that data, and we went and sat down with Google. Because we're on 100 million phones, but Google's on all the Android phones. So they kind of win. Um, and, and actually, we were having a hard time because in, you know, in 100 million devices, we had only seen those, that set of anomalies a very small handful of numbers of times. And so having the ability to go to Google and say, hey, guys, look, here's what we see. Here's what we're looking for. You're on all the phones. Help. And so we worked together. And a few weeks, a few weeks went by, a few months went by. We eventually got to the point in April where we all came out and announced that we found these guys on Android as well as on iOS. And now we're making their lives hard on Android and iOS. And I tell the story mostly so that you understand how we do things, because it's very different than the way security people have traditionally worked. Security people traditionally have started from security knowledge, not from data. And as we see bigger and bigger um, uptake of maliciousness on mobile devices, we expect it to continue to be rare. Across the entirety of Google's billion Android plus Android devices, there were less than 40 infections globally. Think about the needle in the haystack that that is to find. And the, so I was mentioning, you know, sketchy governments NSO sells to. You can get the idea where some of these devices were. And as we track harder and harder actors, you know, more and more uh, sophisticated actors who are playing in this space, finding those needles in those haystacks is going to be harder and harder. And so um, I, I'm here mostly because I wanted to talk about how we do things, also because I want to say that um, I need more people who understand the data side of the world. So if anybody likes security out there, uh, come find me. And, and I'll nerd out with you about all of this stuff, because this is what I like to do. I, I literally I went to, to look out because I think that the only way to play in the modern security world is this way. And um, so if anybody wants to come do this, you know, you know where to find me, and my contact info is up there. But uh, I think it's a way. I think data is the future of security, and, and really finding outliers is the future of security in a way that um, that we haven't really explored yet. I, I was talking to uh, a real expert in AI and machine learning recently, and we were, we were talking about the difficulties that we are about to face. So right now, I don't face very many difficulties because nobody's trying to mess with my, with my baselines. Nobody's really trying to mess with my, uh, my ML. But the next stage of where we're going is soon enough, the NSO group is going to be seeding fake data into my, into my corpus. And, and suddenly, they're going to be trying to change all the baselines I work on, which is unlike, I think, a lot of the other spaces. There's not that many uh, spaces that ML is really great at that has an active adversary trying to screw with them. And that's why I like what I do. You know, I, uh, uh, unlike the folks up here, there's nobody who's you know, trying to intentionally, logistically mess with the supply chain on a daily basis to screw up your machine learning, which makes my space fun. Um, but so I'll leave it there, uh, turn it over for questions. I know I only have a few more minutes, but uh, questions. Yeah. And we'll wait until the microphone gets to you. Where are the microphones? Oh. Over here. Yeah, there. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Nice talk, Mike. Uh, actually, you do have a security geek in the room. Awesome. Uh, 
Uh, so quick question. Uh, it seems that Google's Bouncer was an attempt to uh, identify malicious applications or move them from the Play Store. It seems that that hasn't been successful, and it seems that the uh, percentage of malware has only increased uh, since Bouncer became uh, a thing. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, and why, why do you think that's the case? It seems like we're going in the uh, entirely Hold wrong on, direction. A, uh, I'll, I'll pull a different slide for a second that I had um, that I had in a different in a deck this morning on this same thing because I think it's a, it's an instructive one on this. Look, Bouncer and the iOS App Store are, are great examples of. Um, of people who have a certain level of incentive, but not not the whole incentive, right? It it is up to it's Google's um, uh, it's Google's thing, and uh, hold on, let's just scroll through for a second. What is this thing doing? Um, it is Google and Apple's job to do due diligence, right? That is the entirety of what they're trying to do. And their job is to do the sort of the best they can at, at a certain level, but they don't really have a commercial incentive to get everything. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to be good enough to raise the bar to make it hard to get a certain amount of fraudulent stuff in the app store. So um, there's a, there are app stores in China where between 30 and 40 of the apps in the store are malware. Google's job is just to not be that. And same thing with Apple, right? So Bouncer does a decent job, but we issued 210 takedowns to the Play Store last year of malware that we found in the Play Store. Like, that's, that's almost one a day. You know, that's like that's one like every two. 210 from 2 million, right? So wh well, why, why isn't Google doing a better job to well, identify that, that, that themselves? It's not 210 from 2 million. It's 210 takedowns. Some of those were thousands of apps. Right, so that's that's like, look, we found this family. Here's all of these, right? right? So it's not it's not as simple as two ten from two million. But their job their job isn't to stop the you know to stop every single thing. They just want to keep the the flow low enough that it's commercially viable. Apple's the same way, right? And and Apple actually benefits. They close their ecosystem enough that it's hard for anybody to check their work, right? So if you've ever if you've never tried to download all the apps in the App Store at scale and decrypt them for analysis, I don't recommend it. It's hard. Um, and, and Apple's a partner of ours. Like, I literally have Apple people on speed dial and on text message, and they still make it hard on me. So it's hard to actually go download all those apps and do the analysis. But even in the App Store, right? Like, we find all kinds of stuff that makes it through into the App Store past um, past Apple security review, because what they're really aiming at is commercial viability, not, not Uber security protection. Um, now, if you go talk to them, they're going to say, we take it seriously, and they do, but you know, they're not going to spend $10 million a year on it. They're going to spend what they spend on it, and, and their job is just to get, to get the top layer off, if that makes sense. Um, and so Bouncer's never going to be perfect, and, and we don't... We're, we're glad Bouncer does what it does, but we see ourselves as like the backup plan, right? You put you put stuff on your on your computer, not because Microsoft doesn't do a good job, but because you can't you can't trust one thing. There's always you know defense in depth and a and a heterogeneous ecosystem is always more resilient. You're the backup bouncer. We're the backup bouncer. <laughs> oh. right, let's take. Uh, okay. Let's not take my. Let's not tell my marketing people that one. Okay, so one right in the corner there, yes, and then we'll come through to you. Oh, what's your recommendation for people who have to take mobile devices past borders, whether they be Chinese or American? Oh, we are recording this, aren't we? Um, so, man, I, I have a hard time with that one because, so, so the best recommendation I have, turn it off um, before you transit the border because that way, um, you know, the touch, enable, touch ID won't be enabled. You won't be able to be compelled um, to, uh, as an American citizen, you're not able to be compelled to give up your password. If you're not a citizen, they can do whatever you want. I'm not a citizen here. Uh, this is a thing I worry about often because if you're not a citizen, you have no right to return. And, and so it's tricky. Uh, the, the world of crossing borders right now is very tricky. 
if you have the ability, take your phone and mail it across the border and pick it up when you get home, but I don't know anybody who has that ability. I wouldn't be able to get to the airport if I didn't have my phone. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't call an Uber. I couldn't, I couldn't drive there because I wouldn't know how to get there. Like, so, you know, the whole mail your phone thing, it's good theoretical advice, but it doesn't really work. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know what the solution for that is. Uh, if you guys figure it out, tell me, because I travel a lot, and I could use the advice. Okay. One final question, gentleman right here. So how do you keep the centralized collection of all this data secure itself if you're collecting all this data on the phones? Yeah, so internal security reports up to me as well at Lookout. So um, we we spend a lot of time on it, and we do we do a ton. A lot of it has to do with um, with judicious use of encryption in the right spots. Um, everything we have is encrypted at all times in transit and at rest. The other thing we do is we work really hard not to collect things if we don't need them. You know, so. Um, like, if you look at our enterprise product, we actually, if you deploy this in an enterprise, we don't know what the phone number of the phone is. We don't have anything on the phone other than an identifier that connects back to the enterprise. So we don't know any of the things that you might want to breach. I can, tell, I can tell you an identifier for a phone, and I can tell you everything on that phone, but I can't tell you whose phone it is. And that's intentional, because that reduces our risk. Um, that said, you know, when you have security information on 100 million devices, you have to work pretty hard, and we're a pretty big target. And so we get attacked a lot, and we spend a lot of time, uh, I mean, A, eating our own dog food and protecting our stuff with our, with our own stuff, but, um, but working really hard to make sure that we reduce our vulnerability posture, and we, we do best practices. I mean, the, the guy that I have that's running security has been doing this for 30 years and it has, has forgotten more about protecting companies than most people will ever know. And, uh, and we have a team of really smart folks that I mean, it, there's no real solution to it other than constant diligence, constant effort, constant driving of your development organization to, to work hard to build your product securely from the base. And, and really just um, knowing your threat model because we know we have a very different threat profile than insert startup here that might be doing something that's a lot less uh, of an interesting target. We are, we are a fascinating target. If, if, I am, if I'm a nation state, I could either break into 100 million phones or I could break into us and then read about 100 million phones, which makes us uh, a really interesting target for that kind of stuff. So we, we work at it a lot is, is really, there's no, there's no magic bullet. It's like, uh, it's like going to the gym. You, know, you eat your vegetables, you go to bed on time, and, and you work out every day. That's kind of how we do it. Michael, thanks for sharing your no, thoughts. Thank you.